put our hands together this morning. Like this. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my dream Sing it out, yeah Till I met you I was breathing Oh, I was breathing But not
praise this morning. Hallelujah. Where would you be had Jesus not rescued you, if he'd not called you out of the darkness? Come on, lift your hands this morning. Lift your hands and bless his name. Oh, thank you, Jesus, that you overcame the grave. You called us out of our sin. You made us free people. Hallelujah. I need to rescue my sin was heavy, but change breaking the weight of your glory. I need a shelter. I was a oh yeah. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a
is you. We adore. It is you. Our praises are for only you. The heavens declare. It is you. It is you. Come on, sing that one more time. It is you. collectively worship you, Father, in unity, in one purpose, in one mind. And Lord, we just ask you to inhabit our praises and to come and visit this place today. We declare you are holy, Lord. Holy is the Lord. We say we're is the Lord. We say awesome, so awesome are you, Lord. We say worthy, worthy are you, Lord. it is you I adore it is you all the praises are for only you the heavens declare it is you it
a moment and lift our hands across this room and worship him. Come on, we can sing it, but we got to do it. We got to live it. This just isn't a moment in time where you listen to music, but this is a time where we worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We've been telling you how we love you, Lord God. Thank you, God, you're still on the throne. No one can ever overtake you. You've never been defeated. You've never lost a battle. And you're our God. And we love you, Jesus. And somebody shout amen, 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 amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. I had a thought while we were standing here, we were singing, I was thinking, there's a good many of you here today, which I love that, because it's Memorial Day weekend, there's a million places you could be, right? Yeah. Abby, it's good to see you. You look nice. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yeah, we, Lake and I, on Friday night, we led worship for the district youth lock-in, and we sang Set a Fire, and the verse of that says, there's no place I'd rather be. And I just had that thought in my head, there's a million places that we could be on a weekend like this. We could be cooking hot dogs in the rain, but here we are, which is great. <laughs> I could go for a hot dog, though. 
kind of hungry. Anyway, <laughs> if y'all would with me, turn to Joshua chapter 24. I have learned in my time of ministry, you should never trust somebody who doesn't start with scripture. So Joshua chapter 24. And we're going to go to verses 14 and 15. Whenever you're there, say something that you're there. Say I'm there. Say amen. Say something. Okay, great. <laughs> or it's up here. Kara made me these nice little slides, so we have that. Okay, so Joshua, wait, I have announcements, don't I, Nate? Where's Nate? Yeah, wave your hands, Nate. I told you. Remind me, man. I got the sticky here and everything, and I forgot about it. Nate ever so kindly harassed me to tell you guys that today, men, is the last day to pay for Adventure Fest. So if you signed up and you didn't pay, Nate is going to come hustle you, and um, I assume he's going to search your pockets for change for money for that. So today's the last day to do that, but he's going to be here to hustle you for your money, so make sure you see him for that. Is that all, Nate? We're good on that. Okay, we're Joshua chapter 24, verses 14 and 15. It says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates River and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. We all pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you so much for this day, for this opportunity that um, I get to be here and get to speak to your people. Um, I just thank you for each and every single one of them, for their faithfulness, for their devotion to you and your kingdom. And I just pray, Lord, that they would be receptive of the message that you, I believe, have given to me today for them to hear. And um, everybody who is away, I pray that you would just bless them in their travels. Everybody who is unable to make it, Lord, I just pray that you would bless them in their health and in their strength and um, in their faith as well. And I pray for Pastor Mitchum and Michelle, Julie and Stella, who um, are going to be traveling home, I believe, tomorrow. Um, just be with them. And just be, just use me today, Lord, as a vessel and um, just help me to communicate this message that you have given to me and all the glory, Lord, all the honor and all the praise will go to you as it is due in Jesus name. Amen. So y'all notice I have a little bit more hair than what you're used to seeing up here on Sunday mornings. I have a little bit more muscle too. So um, don't tell pastor I said that. He's probably watching though. Sorry, pastor. I thought I could get away with it. Anyway, so I'm going to give you a little bit of background, right? So Joshua, he is the leader of the Israelites at this at this period of time. He took over after Moses died, right? So at this point, Joshua is getting old and he knows that old people don't live forever. So he presents the Israelites with a question. After he's dead and gone, who will they serve? He tells them to make a choice. So the Israelites, they never had to fight for their land, right? It was given to them by God. Like, God gave it to them. They inherited cities by God. They didn't have to build them up. So for this reason, Joshua is telling the people to fear God and to follow him in sincerity and in truth and to get rid of all the other gods that their ancestors had previously served and worshipped, right? All the false gods, all the gods with the little g's. Yeah. So when Joshua asks them who will they serve, he's referring to who their idol is going to be in their life. So in ancient times, like in their day, their idolization looked different. What did they do? I'm a youth pastor, by the way, so talk to me. Questions aren't rhetorical here today, okay? So their idols were like golden calves, right? Which were like, y'all are a bunch of weirdos. You're worshiping a statue of gold. Like, what's wrong with you? And we laugh maybe about it. But I'm pretty sure if the Israelites saw the things that we worship today, they'd be like, y'all are wild. So come at me talking about my golden calf like that. Anyway. So um, anything that becomes more important to us than God is an idol. That's an idol, right? Anything that becomes more important to us than God. So for the Israelites, it was a golden calf, okay? For us, it could be many other things. 
It might look different now than it did back then, but it's still everywhere that we go. Idols are everywhere, right? So some of us might idolize money. Y'all are like, Pastor Alicia, it is way too early for you to be preaching at me about money, but I'm going to do it anyway, right? So some people, they put their trust in money, right? We got to get by by having money. Sure do. It controls our life. But whenever we place our worth in how much money we have or how much things we own, Side note, you can't take it with you when you die, so it's not that great. That's whenever it becomes a problem. The problem isn't money. The problem is the idolization of money, the love of money, right? The abuse of money. That's what causes problems in our life. Some of us idolize entertainment, sports, TV shows, activities, hobbies, before anything else. The problem is not sports. Sports are great, right? Go Bills. (laughs) <laughs> Sports are great. We love that. We love entertainment. We love hobbies. That's not the problem. The problem is skipping out on what God has for us because we want to fill our minds with things that we consider to be more enjoyable. Some of us idolize our phones and social media. We were talking about this this morning in our young adult group, so if you weren't there, you missed out. But if you can't walk into a room full of people without pulling out your phone... Then you might idolize your phone. If the first thing you do in the morning is check your phone before you thank God for another day, you might idolize your phone. Okay? If you go to bed at night and you have to scroll through Facebook one more time, you might idolize your phone. The problem isn't our phone or social media. There are benefits when it's used correctly. Lake said this morning our phone is a tool, and it can be used in a good way if it's used as a tool. But when it's not, when it's not being used, in a positive way, that's whenever it becomes an idol. That's whenever it becomes a problem. You can use it to proclaim the gospel. You can let people see that you're a godly person, or you can live a totally different life on your phone. Okay, I'll get off that soapbox. Thank you for listening. Some of us idolize ourselves, who we are, our identity. We place our identity in something else or someone else rather than God, and we're like, I am who this person says about me, not I am who God says that I am, right? We just sang that this morning. I am who I am because the I am tells me who I am. We place more value in who we are and our worth as a person sometimes rather than placing our value of who we are in God. Some of us idolize comfort rather than righteously living by God. We want to keep the peace. We don't want to ruffle any feathers. That was something that convicted me this week. I wrote this, and then I had the realization that that's what I was doing, trying to keep man's peace. There's a difference. If you're trying to keep man's peace, you're idolizing comfort. We have to strive for God's peace. Some of us idolize substances. When we feel anxious, overwhelmed, stressed, depressed, we turn to a substance, nicotine, alcohol, something else. It's a very temporary fix, right? Because you're going to want to crave it. You're going to crave it again. You're going to go back to it again, rather than relying on God to help us overcome it. Some of us idolize our flesh. Rather than praying and relying on God to not allow us to be tempted, but you can do that. You know that, right? You can pray and you can ask God to not allow you to be tempted by the devil. You should do that if you haven't done that. You can do that. That's an option. And you can, God can help you to not feel tempted, to not fall into temptation. We fall into sin by our bodies. Um, And it can become an addiction, and that becomes greater than God. Um, Whenever whenever we fall into temptations to sin by our bodies, it just drives a wedge between us and God, us and our relationships with people. Some of us idolize food. I know Joe, Pastor Joe, he loves food. He says that all the time. He's a foodie. I'm not saying that food is his idol. I would never say that. (laughs) But I've seen that man eat, so it's questionable. (laughs) But when we need, when we feel the need for fulfillment, some of us turn to food for comfort, right? But guess what? Y'all gonna get hungry again. Breakfast, lunch, and dinner, midnight snack, frosted flakes at 2 a.m. I'm here for it all. Some of us idolize a person. We rely on a person to pray for us and to protect us and to strengthen us when we're weak. People are good, that's what we're here for. Where two or three are gathered together in his name, right? That's great, we need people. It's better than being isolated and being alone. But if you go to somebody and you say, pray for me, but you didn't lift a single prayer up to God, you might be idolizing that person. Here's a little lesson in discernment. Y'all ready for this? 
This is where the teaching part comes in, lesson in discernment. Idolatry can be prevented. Okay, you can't just run from it because it's temptation to fall into it. That's how that works. But prevention of idolatry, idolatry begins with two things, wisdom and discernment. Some of y'all are like, I don't have wisdom and I don't have discernment. So I guess I'm just going to fall prey to idolization. King Solomon, he prayed for that, literally out loud, on his knees, hands high, right? He prayed, Lord, let me lead these people with wisdom and discernment. Wisdom and discernment are spiritual gifts. They can't be taught. They're given to you by God. So you either pray and seek for that, or you pray that God puts somebody in your life who has the spiritual gift of wisdom and discernment. Here's point number two, lesson in discernment. There's a difference between morality and discernment. I think that often we kind of get that confused. We think morality is discernment, but it's not. Morality is right versus wrong. Discernment is right versus almost right. Right? Right. That's called morality. Whenever you think right versus wrong, whenever you think, should I do this or should I not? Is it right or is it wrong? Should I punch this person in the face or should I not? That's called morality. That's taught. Okay? You were not born like with discernment. You can't be taught discernment. That's a gift that's given with, to you by God, okay? Morality is right versus wrong. Discernment is right versus almost right. I'm going to give you an example by a story, and Lake and Kate and Mackenzie are going to appreciate this so much. So a couple weeks ago, Lake's dad was telling me the story about how him, his name is Dale, and his wife Sue were going to meet up for lunch. So they're like, which Dale then said, he's like, after he told the story, he's like, that could end up in a sermon. Yes, you're welcome, Dale. Here you go. Lesson in discernment. So Dale calls Sue, and he's like, where do you want to go for lunch? And she's like, let's go to Montezuma's. Okay, so they meet at Montezuma's, okay? Dale gets there, and he's looking around and doesn't see Sue there. She's not there yet. Where's Sue? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and go in and get us a table. So that's what she does. That's what he does. He goes in, and he gets him a table. He orders her drink. He orders her food, and he's still waiting on her. He's like, where's my wife? Something must have happened to her. And then Sue, she goes to Montezuma's, and she's looking around, and she doesn't see Dale. So she's like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go in and order a drink and order our food because we get the same thing all the time. And she's sitting there waiting, like, where's my husband? So Dale, being the good and amazing husband that he is, calls Sue and says, where are you at? Are you okay? And she's like, I'm at Montezuma's. Where are you at? And he, Montezuma's is a Mexican restaurant, by the way. It's bomb. It's in Chambersburg. I'll take you if you've never been there. And... Dale's like, I'm at Montezuma's. What are you talking about? Where are you at? He's like, I already ordered our drinks and our food. And then Sue's like, I already ordered our drinks and our food. There's two Montezumas, okay? <laughs> one of them was at the right one, and one of them was at the wrong one. But they did everything right. They both went to Montezuma's, and they ordered the right drink and ordered the right food. One was right, and one was almost right. There you go. There's your lesson in discernment. So... Who or what are you serving? Who or what are you relying on? And where does your victory really come from? We love to call on people to pray for us, right? When we're in the valleys, that's easy. Life is hard right now, please pray. I need a new job, please pray. My kids are wild and crazy, stressing me out, but I can't beat them, so please pray, right? We love to shout out, the battle belongs to you, Lord, all the time when we're in the valleys. That's that's our thing. When things aren't going our way, when we lose our job, the battle belongs to the Lord, right? But when we get the job that we wanted, suddenly it's no longer about the Lord. Suddenly it's about our hard work and our dedication, and we put that crown on, hold that trophy, look what I got, got the job, right? When we lose our house, the battle belongs to the Lord. But when we get the proof for the mortgage loan, when we get to build the house of our dreams, then the victory becomes ours. Here's my crown, check it out. Look at it sparkle, here's my trophy. Put it on the mantle, right? When we're struggling with anxiety and depression, addiction, sexual sin, we so desperately wanna overcome that. We want that, we feel it in our spirit. Lord, take this away from me, the battle belongs to you. But when it does, when we have a good day, here's my, here's my crown, check it out. Here's my trophy, right? If the battle belongs to the Lord, then who's the victory belong to? The Lord, thank you, all one of you. Lindsay, you to bomb. If the battle belongs to the Lord, then you better believe the victory belongs to the Lord, right? Give the crown, put the crown on the king's head who it belongs to, and put the, give the trophy back into his hands. He's the one who fought the battle for you. You want him to fight the battle, but then we, not, I shouldn't say you, we want him to fight the battle, but we want the victory. Doesn't make sense. 
Valleys teach you things that mountaintops never will, right? Amen? Valleys teach you things that mountaintops never will. So again, where does your victory really come from? And who will you serve? Jesus is the only one who can save us and deliver us. So if something happens in your life, and before you even think about praying and speaking to God, but instead you go to pastor and you say, pray for me, then guess what? You've missed the mark. Not that we won't pray for you. Of course we'll pray for you. We'll pray for you right then and there. We'll say, how can I help you? What can I pray for you about, right? That's what we're here for. This is our job. But before you lift up a prayer to God and you come to us first, we've missed the mark, right? Pastor is your friend. Pastor's there to support you spiritually. That's how I am with all my kids. I see all of these cute little kids who get to be in here today because we don't have kids' church because it's the fifth Sunday. I love all of these kids with every ounce of my being and I pray for them and I am their friend and I'm their spiritual leader but I'm not their Jesus right pastor Mitchum is not your Jesus if something happens and the first thing that you do is pick up nicotine or alcohol or some other substance then guess what we've missed the mark that thing may numb the pain for a minute it might quiet you and bring stillness to you calmness to you for a minute but it's gonna come back and that thing's not your Jesus once the effects wear off, that's not your Jesus, right? Your grandma and your parents, your pastor, your friends, your addictions, your neighbors, your spouse. What do I know about being married? Well, I'm not, but I'm going to get there in a minute. Your children, they're never going to be able to do for you what God can do for you. Amen. Let me give an example. When I say your spouse, I know who's this little girl up here? She's not even married yet. She don't know what she's talking about. Who gives her the right? God does, so I'm going to say it anyway. I love Lake, right, with all my heart. If you haven't met Lake, you're missing out. I'll introduce you to him if you want. He's my best friend. He is my companion. He's my partner, my teammate. He prays for me. He holds my hand beside me and leads me. He's not in front of me being authoritative. He's not behind me pushing me like I'm a pack mule. He's beside me. He prays for me when I need help. He strengthens me when I'm weak. But guess what? He's not my Jesus. Okay, if you make your spouse your Jesus, you've missed the mark. Your idols are temporary. They're never going to fulfill you. Jesus is eternal, right? Jesus has already fulfilled it all. There's one thing Jesus has left to do, and what is it? To come on back on that cloud. <laughs> That's it. All that's left for him to do is to return again. These things that we idolize and we serve before God will never, ever measure up, and we will never find fulfillment in them. So Joshua says, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. See, he's saying that no matter what the Israelites choose in that moment, he's already had his mind made up. He says, it doesn't matter what you say or what you choose or what you want to do. My mind is made up. As for me and my house, regardless of you, I'm going to serve the Lord. I'm not going to change my mind. Your decision doesn't change my decision. So the first thing is that there's a choice that needs to be made. That graphic looks awesome, Kara, by the way. Thank you. You're the bomb. The second part is a challenge. If you go back to Joshua 24, um, verses 16 to 21, it says, Then the people answered, Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we travel. And the Lord drove out before us all the nations, including the Amorites who lived in the land. So we too will serve the Lord because he is our God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods, he will turn and bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, we will serve the Lord. So the people are acknowledging where their strength comes from, right? The Lord. Where their victory comes from, the Lord. They remember all the things that God did for them when they were slaves in Egypt, when they were in the valley, right? They're remembering all those hard times when they were in the valley. And then they rightfully give the victory to God. They're remembering their battles. And they say, God gets the victory because God took care of the battle. He gave us the land and he gave us the cities, right? They make a choice by saying that they will serve the Lord. But then you see Joshua challenges them. He openly gives them another chance to respond to make sure that they really understand what they're saying and what they're proclaiming. 
He gives them a choice, but then he challenges them on that choice. Joshua knows it's not going to be easy, right? He reminds them of what will happen if they choose not to serve the Lord or if they say that they will serve the Lord, serve the Lord but then they turn their backs on the decision that they make. So why does this matter? Because when you make your choice, you better know that the challenges are going to come your way, right? The higher up you go, the bigger that target on your back is going to get. And people are going to come at you and say things about you. People are going to mock you. People are going to despise you. People are going to make their opinions about you. People are going to turn their backs on you. Not everybody's going to accept you. You're going to be a new Christian weirdo. Congratulations. Join the club. Welcome. We love to have you. We love it here. Big old group of weirdos serving the Lord. You're going to be different, right? Are you ready for that? Are you ready to be faced with the challenges and the hard questions that you may pre be presented with? Well, explain this. Explain that. Good luck. To continue in the, to finish out the chapter, Joshua 24, verses 22 to 24. Then Joshua said, you are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. And they say, yes, we are witnesses. Now then, says Joshua, throw away the foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord, our God, and obey him. So Joshua reinstates the fact that they have chosen to serve the Lord. That's the choice that they make. And then to finish out the chapter, Joshua sets up a little stone. And he's like, when you see this stone here, it might have been big, I don't know. See this stone, when I think stone, I think like this. He's like, when you see this stone here, you will remember the decision, the choice that you made on this day, right? What does that mean? Hold yourselves accountable. The stone is going to hold you accountable. I don't know. People did weird stuff back then. But my point is, they had to hold each other accountable, right? You made this decision. You said you're going to serve the Lord. You're accountable to that. And we're accountable to each other. I'm accountable to you guys, right? We're accountable to each other. We're accountable to God of the decision that we made. So Joshua sets up this stone and he says, this is, your, this is how you know, this is how you remember that you, are, that you are witnesses to one another of the decision and the choice that you made on this day. So first of all, you have a choice. Second of all, you will be challenged in that choice. And third of all, you need to tell the Lord that it is he who you have chosen. Why? Because you have been chosen by him. So how do you know that you've been chosen? We've all been called to be set apart, right? Do you all know that? Everybody's born to be, to be called to be set apart. So whenever I was in ministry school, first of all, I spent two years in ministry school. I was the youngest. I was the only girl, and I was the only one who wasn't married. So I got picked on. I had to get asked all the hard questions, so, which is fine, because I had all the right answers, so I didn't mind. Anyway, though. I was asked this question, how do you know when you are saved? Like my instructor asked me, he's like, how did you know when you were saved? I was like, I don't know, I just knew, right? Some of us can remember the day and the time and where we were and what happened, but others of us might be like, I don't know, I just knew, I just woke up one day and decided I'm going to serve the Lord today, and it's just been smooth sailing ever since, probably not. But he asked me, how did you know when you were saved? And I was like, well, this is how I got saved. So I'll give you a little bit of a backstory. So I was 19, right? I lived in Little Old Mercersburg. Y'all never heard of it. I know, far away from here. Never land. And my pastor was Marcus Abernethy, and he preached this message. I went to church for like a couple years at this point. I just sat in the pew. I just liked to clap. The music was good. I had a good time. I had some friends there. Whatever. He preached this message, and he called people pubitatoes. I didn't like that. He said that pu he called them pew potatoes, and he said that they were people who just came into the church. They sat down in the pew. They clapped their hands. They sing the music. They had friends there. They listened to the message, but every day they left, and they lived the same lifestyle that they had always lived, and nothing in them ever changed. They were pew potatoes. So I was like, yeah, that's how I knew. That was the day that I got saved. I knew that because I was shaking in my knees, and I gave my heart to the Lord, and I said, I want to change, and I want to live and be better. And I was reading my Bible, and I was trying to learn and understand all the things that I was doing wrong, which was a lot. So I was like, that's how I knew that I was saved. And he's like, that's not how you knew you were saved. That's when you got saved. How did you know when you were saved? The answer to that is simple. You have to do two things. Romans 10.9. Y'all know it. 
One, confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And two, believe it in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you'll be saved. You're like, Pastor Alicia, could it really be that simple? Yep, sure is, that's it. I think a big thought that a lot of people have is where would I go if I were to die right now? A lot of you have probably asked yourself that. And that's a really hard question, too. I, I was a CNA. I went to nursing school to be a CNA, and I worked as a CNA while I was in ministry school to pay for that. So I experienced death a lot, and I held a lot of hands, and I, I felt a lot of pulses leave people's bodies that I wasn't sure of where they were gonna go, and I don't think that they were sure of where they were gonna go. I had one resident one time who was a devout atheist, and he used to ask me about school. He knew that I was in school for ministry, and he would ask me about it, and he knew he didn't believe in it, but he would still ask me how my classes were going. And then he fell sick, and all of a sudden, he said to me, he's like, Alicia, I'm afraid that I'm gonna die. He was dying, he was gonna die, but I didn't have the heart to say that at the moment. You can't look an old person in the face and say, yeah, you're gonna die. It doesn't work like that. So I was like, I'm here for you, you know? So that was the time then when he realized, I don't know where I'm gonna go if I die. And he had this realization that maybe there really are only two options. And maybe I really do need to figure this out. And then he called on the chaplain. He wanted the chaplain to come and to talk to him. And I wasn't there for that conversation, so I don't know how that went, but I'm saying that there's still a chance at any point in somebody's life. And then a couple weeks ago, I had a distant um, family member who her mother passed away, and she asked me, they were in a, in a frenzy to find somebody to do a funeral. That was the first funeral I ever did. Straight up did not have a good time. I didn't like that, that was hard. But I had to do it because that's what the Lord has called on me to do as an ordained minister, so that's what I did. And I was asking the family about her and about her spirituality. And they said she didn't go to church, but she was a child of God. And I think that that was so beautiful. Like what a way to be talked about and what a way to be remembered, right? But then, at the viewing, one of the three daughters, she was crying and she came to me and she pulled me aside and she said, I need you to pray for my mom. She had been dead at this point for five days and she said, I need you to pray for my mom because she was never saved, but I know that there's still time. So initially in my head, I'm like, there ain't no more time, baby girl, like time's up. But then again, I thought God corrected me in my spirit, right? A day on earth is but a thousand years in heaven and a thousand years is but a day. So five days to us, she could have still been at the gates. She could have still had her chance. I don't know. I can't say. I don't know that for sure. But what I'm saying is that we all have a choice to make now. And we all have a way that we can live and choose to live now in our walk and how we are now, right? And then, this is another thought. I don't have this written down, so Lord help me. But two weeks ago, my mom called me and she said that my cousin was shot seven times and was killed and that she wanted me to do the service for him. I was like, how in the world do you do a service for a man like that? When you don't know, you know the lifestyle that they live. You know that the choices that they made were 100% not of the Lord. How do you do a service for somebody like that? Like how I said earlier, how we idolize comfort and we idolize peace. Whose peace though? Man's peace or God's peace, right? That was a rough week for Pastor A. She had a rough time with that. I felt obligation by my family to have to serve them in that way to do that, but I didn't feel like that was a way of serving God. I couldn't stand behind, I couldn't rightfully stand behind a pulpit and proclaim lies about somebody and talk about how they were a godly person and bring comfort to the rest of my family in that way. I couldn't do it. So because my spirit was disturbed in that, I finally had to say, no, I'm not doing this, sorry. I can't, because I didn't know. I didn't know for sure, and I couldn't speak lies on behalf of God for somebody that I didn't know where they ended up. Maybe that was a little bit too deep, but we shouldn't be afraid to proclaim the gospel that's true. And we shouldn't be afraid to proclaim that God is king of all, right? So you see on this day, when Joshua gave the Israelites this question, what did they say? They said, we will serve the Lord. And he said, but will you? And they said, yeah, we'll serve the Lord. In other words, they're saying, hashtag challenge accepted. We will serve the Lord. Joshua's like, okay, 
Do it. Hold yourselves accountable. I'm holding you accountable, and for generations to come, hold yourselves accountable. But you know what they did? They stood with their fingers crossed behind their back. Y'all read the rest of the Bible. It gets messy. Go through all the kings, right? Samuel said, y'all don't want a king. Don't do that. They were like, we want a king. All the other nations have a king. We want a king. And then it went downhill from there, right? They had their spiritual fingers crossed. They confessed it with their mouth. They proclaimed it with their mouth. They said, this is what we're going to do. We're going to serve the Lord. Woohoo! They probably rejoiced for a day or two or ten. I don't know. Moved on about their lives. Had a couple kids. They were like, this gets really hard. We don't like this anymore. Let's go get a king. Wear that crown. Hold that trophy. Right? Victory is ours. We're going to conquer all these cities. Right? They, they confessed it and they proclaimed it with their mouths, but their hearts were hardened to letting God take over their life. Y'all got some questions? That's fine. I got some answers. Why did, Jesus, why did Joshua give Israelites a choice? He cared for them. Right? Why else would he give them a hard choice like that? If you care about somebody, then you better make them choose. We talked about that this morning, too, in Young Adult Group. Everybody needs correction. I need correction. Lindsay better correct me if I say something wrong. I'm accountable to her. She's my friend. Same with Wendy. Same with all of you. I'm accountable to you. So why did Joshua give the Israelites a choice? Because he cared for them. He wanted good things for them. This is why we're given a choice, right? We're cared about by God, and he wants us to want him the way that he wants us, right? So why did Joshua challenge them? Y'all, he knew. He knew that this was going to be the absolute easiest thing that they could do. Everything else was only going to get harder. Saying yes to Jesus is the easy part. You can just say, it. yes, God, I'll serve you, Sure. But whenever he says, get up onto a platform and speak a word that I gave you, or lift your hands, even though it feels awkward, I'm not saying that you have to, I'm saying when God tells you to do something and you don't do it, it gets harder when you be disobedient to God, right? It's easy to confess it. It's easy to say, yes, Lord, I'll serve you, but will you? When he tells you to move, are you going to move? When he says jump, are you going to say how high? Right? He knew, he challenges them because he knew that this was going to be the absolute least of the challenges that they were going to face. When they said, we will serve the Lord, he says, but will you? That was the easy part. That was the easy question. Your faith is going to be tested, right? Y'all ever have your faith tested? Your kids ever make you want to knock them out? Okay, your faith has been tested then. Your devotion is going to be questioned. You're going to be challenged to stick to the choice that you've made. Some days it's going to be so much easier just to say, I don't want to do this anymore. I struggled with that this past week. God has wrecked me over and over and over again this week, over and over again. And I found myself coming to a point where I was like, God, what am I doing? And he's like, I'm using you. That's what I'm doing. I said, what are you doing, not what am I doing? I said, Lord, what are you doing? What do you want from me? And he's like, I'm using you. I was ready to throw in the towel. That's how I felt. I was so down, like, over it. I felt like all the pressure of the world, I couldn't deal with it. But God was like, I'm using you. He corrected me. It's a challenge to come into the presence of God and to fully surrender him to, to him, to fully surrender to him. But that's a challenge that you have to overcome because you want to overcome it, because you want to come into the presence of God and lay your burdens down, because you want to come into the presence of God and you want to overcome the things that are weighing you down. You know, Pastor and I, we can't come into your house. I mean, we could if you invited us in, but we could, like SWAT team, come and bust down the door. You see that kick, Pastor? I've been practicing we can't come into your house busting down the door like the SWAT team and saying, okay, where are they at? Give me the CDs. Let me scratch them up, right? Give me the bottles. Give them to me. Let me pour them out for you. Give me your whatever the cool kids are doing these days, your cigarettes and your vape. Let me throw it out. Tear down the posters. Give me the magazines. I'll rip them up for you. Give me all your little devices. I'm going to put safe browsers on all your iPad, your computer, your phone. I'm going to be careful with what I say because there are children in the room, but hello. A lot of people are addicted to it. Middle schoolers, too. They know about it. There's a statistic. This isn't in my notes, so Lord help me. There's a statistic I learned when I was in ministry school. It says 50% of men in church are addicted to adult entertainment. I think it's a lot higher than that. Number one, because not everybody in the world was surveyed. Number two, I think a lot of those men probably lied and didn't confess that it was an addiction or a problem. 
Number three, they didn't include women. Women, you ain't out either, okay? And children, like I said, high schoolers, middle schoolers, they know. But Pastor and I can't do that. We can't come in and do it for you. We can't say, okay, here's a brand new four and a half hour long Christian playlist that I slaved over making two and a half days. I spent making this for you so you have some good music. I don't got time for that. I'll send you the one that I have, but those are the songs I like, so you don't like them, sorry. Either way, we don't got time for that. I don't know where all of y'all live. I don't got time to be driving all over the place to come and bust down your door. It sounds like fun when you think about it, but that sounds like a lot of work, too. I'm only 5'2". Okay, tiny but mighty, but still, that's a lot of doors to break down. Right? We don't have time to do all of that work for you. You got to do it yourself. But you know, y'all ain't going to like me for this. It takes two hands to put to the plow to do work, right? If you have both hands behind your back with your fingers crossed, you can't get any work done. That's the whole point and why Pastor and I can't do it for you. You gotta put your hands to the plow. If you wanna overcome it, you gotta do it on your own. You gotta be able to lift your hands and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Remember the last time I preached? Some of you don't. Head, heart, and hands. You know it in your head. You know what you need to do. The spirit gets a hold of your heart, and then with arms high and heart abandoned, you say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Help me to do it. We have to fully surrender to trust God to help us in our walk, right? And the third question, why do we have to proclaim that it's the Lord that we've chosen? Why can't I just silently make that decision? Why do people have to know about it? God better be proud of that. If you're going to make that decision, you better be proud of it. And if you're not, don't bother telling God that you've made that decision because you, you haven't. Okay? He wants us to tell him that we have chosen him because he tells us, hello, that we are chosen by him. Does he not? He says, you are chosen. I have chosen you. I have set you apart since birth. I want you to want me the way that I want you. That's what God says to us. The least we can do is proclaim it back to him and proclaim it to all the people that we know, not just us. We know here we're good to go, right? <laughs> That was rhetorical, don't answer that. Confess it with your mouth and believe it with your heart, right? So then, we think, where do we go from here? Number one, y'all have a choice to make. We all have a choice to make. If you don't have a choice to make, you know somebody that has a choice to make. Yeah? Yeah. Joshua says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So as for you and your house, who or what will you serve? The one, you have a choice to make. Make your choice. Number two, be certain about your choice. You better know. If that's really what you want, you better know. Pick a side. Okay? There's no in-between. No left foot in the church house and right foot in the nightclub. Y'all didn't like that. That's okay. You can't, you can't be on both sides of the fence. You can't be in the dead grass and the green grass, right? You can't have your cake and eat it too. Y'all know that. Y'all know somebody who needs to know that. One, make your choice. Two, be certain about your choice. Y'all know the scripture in Revelation that is way overused and that everybody's tired of hearing because it convicts all of us and we don't like to feel convicted. We don't like to feel guilt. Chapter 3, verses 15 and 16 says, I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. He says that, he says, I wish that you would be either one or the other. So because you are, what, lukewarm? Because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. I know that y'all are obsessed with coffee. It's 2021. Everybody here drinks coffee except for Pastor Alicia because she don't need it. I'm hyper enough on my own. But you know whenever you go through the Dunkin' drive through you order your coffee one of two ways, either hot or cold. Y'all see where I'm going with this. If you get your coffee hot, and it comes to you, and it is lukewarm, it's stale, it's stagnant. This pot was made at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's now 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and you've been, they had slow business in that day, and they gave you the same pot of coffee. What are you going to do? You're going to turn around and go back and say, I just spent $5 on this big old coffee, and it tastes like garbage. And then you're going to urge them to make it right. Are you not? Yeah? What if you like your coffee cold, iced? That's how you guys drink it, but like this much cream, this much sugar, and like this much coffee. Yeah, y'all think I don't know. We're Rashad and Rashawn today. Them and their coffee. 
But if you get it, you pay, you pay like, what, six or seven dollars for these big old honking coffees? Creams, really, hazelnut, right? Pay all this money for this coffee, you want it iced, and then you get it, and it's all watered down. Y'all know where I'm going with this. It's all watered down. You're gonna go back, and you're gonna urge them to make it right, are you not? So is it too much to ask when God, when, you know, the book of Revelation is written by John, but those are Jesus' words. John was being obedient, writing down the words that Jesus said, okay? Is it too much for Jesus to be asking, be either hot or cold? I don't want this stale, stagnant version of your hot faith. I don't want this watered down version of your cold life and the cold heart, your cold hardened heart, right? Pick one. Right? Is it too much to ask? If we can go back to the Dunkin' Donuts drive-thru and say, make this right, because I paid for that. Jesus literally paid his life. This ain't in my notes. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> Jesus literally paid his life. And all he's asking is for us to make it right. You pay $5 for a cup of coffee, and you demand that it be made right. At least we're given a choice. Right? So one, make your choice. Two, be certain about your choice. And three, commit to your choice. This is funny to me. The day that Pastor asked me to preach this morning, he didn't ask me, he told me. He voluntold me. He said, write this down, Pastor Alicia. You be preaching on this day because I need a vacation. I said, Pastor, so do I. Anyway, <laughs> I'd rather be here talking about him, so it's fine. <laughs> I'm having a good time. Anyway, that day, my heart started pounding. I was like, oh, do I have to? Yeah, you do. You're an ordained minister. It's kind of your job. So I went up to my office after we had our morning meeting and I said, Lord, what do you want me to preach on? Because I got a month, but I need to know now. <laughs> because Wendy told me today, she's a wreck. Yep, better believe it. I feel better though, thank you. <laughs> but I said to the Lord, I was like, Lord, you already know how I feel about this. So what do you want me to say? What do I need to preach on? And I opened my Bible and there it was, Joshua. He said, there it is. That's what I felt like in that moment that that's what it was. But I knew, I was like, if in a month from now, I still remember this, and I still have this on my heart, then I know that that's from the Lord, because otherwise it's just me and my own willful thinking, thinking, hurry up, I gotta pick something right now, right? So I had this on my mind for a while, like the last month. I've been thinking about it, I drive, I think about it, imagining myself speaking it, making sure I have it all together in my head before I ever even put it down on paper. And about two weeks ago, Lake texted me in the morning, and he had this thought that struck him. He said that he was listening to something that explained the word that we know as love. To us, it means a feeling. I love that. I love hugs. I love my friends and my children. That's a feeling that we have. But in Hebrew, it means a lot more than a feeling. He said that it means it's a decision to be wholeheartedly devoted 100%. See, the American language, we got it all jacked up. We got it. We got it all wrong. We're talking about love as a feeling. Hebrews, they know, they know what's up. They're like, love is more than a feeling. Love is a wholehearted devotion, 100%, which is exactly how God intended it, is it not? Why do we get married? You don't get married because you love the feeling that somebody gives you. You get married because you have a wholehearted devotion, 100%, to that person. Y'all ever read the Song of Solomon? Because if not, you better, because it's entirely 100% directed and parallel our relationship, man and woman, in marriage is our relationship that Christ has to us as the church. We can trust God and we can listen to him, but in the end, hello, it's still our choice to make of whether or not we will walk the path that is narrow or walk the one that is broad. And this parallels our human interactions too and our human relationships too. Y'all know I did sports. I did sports too as a teenager. And I was a cheerleader and I liked to run track. I was kind of fast, kind of. I liked to run and I was a cheerleader, but before I was ever even saved, before I ever even made that decision, I knew that I didn't have practices or games on Wednesdays or Sundays ever. Am I saying that sports are bad? No, no, don't get mad at me for this. Sports are good, do sports. If you have a game, go to it. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying when you say, church is boring and I don't want to sit in church and listen to church, because I want to go and go to a football game or go to something that is more entertaining for me, then that's when it's a problem. Do your sports, please. Don't let anybody tell you not to do your sports. Do your sports, but I'm saying 
when it becomes an idol and when you say, I don't want to go to church, the difference is when you say, I want to go to church, but I have this commitment because sports are a commitment. Okay, that's the difference. Sports and entertainment will always come second to me, to God. Worship team, y'all can come ahead back up. Money too. Money is important, right? That's what makes the world go round. Y'all are tired of hearing about money? We need money to get by in life, right? I moved out when I was 17. I was a senior in high school. Can you imagine a 17-year-old kid nowadays trying to make it on their own? This wasn't long ago, seven years ago. I've been on my own for seven years, and let me tell you, I struggled every single day of my life since that day of February. It was in February with money. But if it came to, okay, Alicia, you got to pay a bill on time. Maybe when I was 17, I didn't think of it that way. I wasn't in church at that time. But now, if it's okay, Alicia, you got a bill to pay. Either you pay it or you pay your tithe. Money will always come second to me, to God, to anything. Entertainment will always come second to me. Yeah, go camping. Go on your vacations. Do that. Seriously, do that. You deserve it. Y'all work so hard. Y'all are amazing people of God. You work hard in your job, so do that. I'm not telling you not to do that. I'm telling you not to idolize that. I'm saying whenever your flesh tells you that it needs to be satisfied in an ungodly way, your flesh better come second to God. That's not my notes either, so thank you, Lord, for that. I'm saying that whenever you have a prayer, you have a need. Lindsay, I'm never going to come to you first without going to God first. You know that? When do you know that? I'm never going to stand up here and say, y'all, I need help. Because y'all better check me and say, only God can help you. You can take my hands and you can pray with me, right? You can say, let us come together in an atmosphere of praise and an atmosphere of prayer. But if your first prayer isn't lifted up to God before somebody else's prayer for you is lifted up to God, then people are coming first to you before God, and people should always come second to you before God. I know that our phones and our social media, they have good benefits to them. I have family in Tennessee. That's where my roots are. And I have family in Florida and I don't get to see them, but I have them on social media so they know about my life, and it's a good thing. Like we said this morning, our phones are a tool if it's used correctly. But if you're waking up in the morning and you'd rather see how many people gave you a like because that's how you need your validation, or before you go to bed at night and you say amen, instead you go to bed and you make sure that your, your ego is fulfilled, all your posts have been made and you know everything about everybody's life, then guess what? Your phones and your social media have come first before God. And that's where the idols start to come in. And that's where it gets dangerous. That's where we tread in murky water. You don't need validation from anything else other than God. And if you do, I'm a words of affirmation person. I've done that my whole life. Don't touch me. Don't do anything for me. Don't buy me anything. I don't like it. Okay, I don't need to spend time with you every day. I love Lake, I like spending time with him. He's cool, he's the only person I wanna hang out with. But I don't have time for full-time friends, okay? I'm a words of affirmation person, so I get it. You get validation by words, by people filling you up. But there's nothing anybody on this earth can say to me that will ever be greater than what God has already said about me. Y'all feel me in that? How about your spouses? If your husband says, I'm tired, I don't want to go to church today. Pastor A, what are you talking about? You're not even married. Yeah, I'm going to keep going, though. If your husband says, I'm tired, I don't want to go to church today, let's just watch it online. This isn't in my notes either, so thank you, Lord. Are you going to say, I'm going to church anyway? I'm taking the car, and I'm going to church anyway. Or are you going to say, okay, let's just stay at home and sit on the couch, eat potato chips and frosted flakes, breakfast, whatever we want. What if your wife says that she doesn't want to go to church today? Men are supposed to be leaders of their house, right? I was talking about this the other day that I feel as though we are in a generation of weak men and really, really disgustingly strong women. 
Women should not have to be as strong as they are these days. I grew up in my life without a dad. I grew up with a really, really strong woman. She was all that I had. But she was never Jesus to me. And we needed a male leader in our house. We needed a male leader who said, get up and go to church. I saw last week Amanda was sick. And guess what? Dave was here with his kids. I saw the other week Kelly Waleski. She took a girl's trip. She deserved that. She is a hardworking mother. She deserved that trip. And Sean Waleski was here with his kids. That's good. We need good, strong men like that. Men need to lead. But if your spouse says, I'm tired, I don't want to go to church today, I had a long week, and you listen to that, you put him before God, who are you really serving? You trying to keep the peace, trying not to ruffle any feathers in your household, or are you going to go and take the car and get yourself to church? I love Lake. With every, every part of my being, I would say, the Hebrew word for love, I'm wholeheartedly devoted to him. He's a leader in my life when I need him. Y'all tired of hearing about Lake yet? He's a great guy. I feel privileged to brag about him. He is a leader in my life, and he supports me in everything. And when I get down and out, I'm a pastor. I pray all day long for y'all. Even if it's just a sentence, you come in my mind and I pray. I say, Sierra, you are a beautiful young woman because you are, and I talk to the Lord about you. I say, Sierra is beautiful, she is young, she is strong, she has amazing parents. Lord, protect her and guide her in everything that she does. But you know, sometimes as a pastor, you get tired of praying, and you get tired. The weight of the world is on your shoulders, and the weight of everybody else's world is on your shoulders. And you get to a breaking point, and when I get to that breaking point, Lake, as the leader and the man in my life, comes to me and he holds my hands and he says, let's pray. The first thing that he does is say, let's pray. Man, if you ain't doing that with your wives, you messing up. Just saying. But if it came down to, I had a choice to make. I could spend 100 years here on this earth with Lake Bender, or I could spend an eternity in heaven. Lake would always come second to God. about your choice. Y'all gotta know. Sierra, your life is about to change when you graduate high school, baby. You better know. And are you sure about that? Are you certain? Are you sure about that? I challenge you in that. The way that Joshua challenged the Israelites. Do you really know? Is that really who you want to serve? And number three, commit to your church, to your choice wholehearted devotion, not one day in and one day out, or one foot in and one foot out, but wholehearted devotion to God. Give him the reverence that he deserves, that he laid down his life for. Each and every single one of you are so precious. Q, you are precious, and Kizzy is precious. You are a strong woman, and you are the leader because you've had to be. wholehearted devotion. I just want to let y'all know that I am here for you. I'm young, but I'm not dumb. So if you need prayer, I am here. I'm going to be right down here. Come to me. You need a hug? I got plenty of them. I stocked up this week on hugs, so here for that. I can pray for you. I will pray for you. But I just want that to just settle in your spirit. What choice you have to make? And are you sure about it? And are you ready for it? And all the struggles and all the challenges that are gonna come your way, are you ready for that? And commit to it. Hold yourself accountable. Hold your friends and your family accountable. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, Lord, as though I 
have done what you have asked of me. And I just pray now that every word that I said would not fall on deaf ears, Lord, but that every single person would just let that manifest in them and give them a greater sense of encouragement and a greater feeling of worth and value and validation that they maybe have been longing for and searching for for so long, Lord. I just pray that every single person who is sitting here and every single person who is watching online just knows how important they are to you, what you mean to them, and what they mean to you. Let them know, Lord, that they are chosen and they have freedom in you. And Lord, I just pray that they would make their choice today in wholehearted devotion to live for you and to serve you in spirit and in truth. And that when the hard times come, that they would not stop running their mouth about you. That when they're persecuted, Lord, that they would just continue to praise you. And when they're questioned, Lord, that you would give them the wisdom and the, and the discernment, the same way that King Solomon prayed for wisdom and discernment. Lord, I just pray that you would just overflow in them. So much that their cup just runs over and pours out of them. I pray that we would just have a heart of so much hunger for you that we would go with our spiritual cups and we would just pour them out entirely just so that we can be filled back up by you. Lord, I just pray that everybody would feel your peace and your comfort and know that they are exactly where you would have them. And if not, Lord, I pray that they strive for that and that they never lose sight of their calling and who you have called them to be, who you want them to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, I'll be down here. We're going to worship the Lord some more. And I'm going to let Joe close us out with worship. And I am here for you, and I love you. I'm a youth pastor, but I do life with all people. I know your kids, so I have to know you. But it's a privilege to know you. Would you mind standing one more time this morning as we sing a few more worship songs? So fitting to an end of them. From the word that Pastor Alicia has given this morning. There is a king seated among us. Let every heart receive him now.
Bless the Lord. 